Good evening, Tonsay, and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. The bail hearing of a Saskatchewan woman who was facing charges in an alleged parent abduction case is currently in progress. Three sureties have put up $113,000 towards her bail. The hearing is currently breaking as the judge prepares her decision. For more on this decision, you can go to our website at www.aptnnews.com ca for the latest information almost 70 percent of households in nunavut experience food insecurity simply put they go hungry at some point in the year our Kent Driscoll dropped in on a conference in a designed to create more food closer to home Nunavut's rate of hunger continues to rise. A Kaluit Food Center reports that when federal pandemic financial benefits were available, they were serving less than 100 meals a day to hungry Kaluit mute. Now, the number is up to over 450 daily in a town of just under 8,000 people. The loss of the benefit and inflation means more people than ever in Nunavut are going hungry. That's why these Baffin Island residents are meeting in a Kaluit for Niri Katagit, a food security roundtable. One of the biggest reasons for Nunavut's high cost of food is that Nunavut imports almost all its food via airplane. Food grown or raised closer to home means savings for Nunavut. That's why Sonny Gray from North Star Agriculture traveled here from Yukon. He's an experienced Arctic farmer and had ideas to share. Here's what he heard when he brought up the idea of using low-tech community freezers. And some of those elders, they, they piped up pretty quick and said, yeah, you know what, when I was little, that's how we did it. And so the introduction of technology has its merit and, it's, and it, has its, you know, it, it has its negative side as well. And so we see that a lot, I think, in the north. Every community in Nunavut has one of these, a dump. These aren't landfills, these are dumps with little or no sorting or recycling. Properly composted, that's nutrient-rich soil that could be growing food. And, and composting is a, is a combination of food waste and animal waste and, and you know, carbon, so cardboard, chipped cardboard, or there's, there's lots of that that's, it's waste, and it's going to waste when we think it could probably be used to build some soil. There are a few greenhouses in Nunavut. This is Iqaluit. The one in Iqaluit donates much of their food to the local food center. That potential soil being lost to the dump could be used to grow food. Growing food can be done in northern temperatures, according to a person who does it. And a lot of the cold climate that they experience here is, is the same as what we get in the Yukon. You know, that minus 30, minus 40. We even have minus 50. I was farming for two weeks and minus 50. Um, so that's, that part's transferable. The lack of soil makes it challenging, but it's not insurmountable. Nunavut's food situation is already desperate. Even more so when you remember that Nunavut has Canada's youngest and fastest growing population. Whatever these delegates figure out how to grow, one thing is certain, people will eat it. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. The National Day for Truth and Reconciliation will not be a statutory holiday in Manitoba. September 30th is a day to honor First Nations, Inuit and Métis survivors, their families and communities. Last year was the first National Day since the federal government passed legislation in 2020. While September 30th is a statutory holiday for its federal government employees and federally regulated workplaces, it's up to the provinces and territories to make the decision. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs says it is disappointed in the decision of the Manitoba government. The province says it needs more time to consult on a stat holiday. AMC says the province has had seven years to make a decision. That's when the TRC released its call to action on the stat holiday. AMC says making September 30th a provincial holiday would be a step in reconciliation efforts and allow people to gather in ceremony without the burden of sacrificing their income. An Indigenous woman hopes to bring awareness to residential schools by walking across Canada. Last year, with some supporters, she walked from Winnipeg to BC and is now on her way to the East Coast. Tamara Pimentel met up with her and has this report. <laughs> Let's go. 
At exactly 2.15, Jazz LaValle and Virgil Moore departed from the former Assiniboia Residential School in Winnipeg to begin a 3,500 kilometer journey. We love and we care. It's the same deal as last year. I just don't want it to die out. And I want our survivors, I want children to know, like there's people here that care and will walk a million miles. Last year, the pair walked from Winnipeg to the Kamloops Indian Residential School to bring awareness to the 215 unmarked graves that were discovered. Today, with a backpack full of items representing the children, they continue that walk to Nova Scotia, stopping at other residential schools along the way. For La Valley, the walk has many meanings. She was born with dislocated hips and was told she would likely be confined to a wheelchair her whole life. She says the ability to walk for those that can't is her purpose. I don't want it to die out. I want it to keep going. It's not something that you just go to sleep and forget about the next day. It's us that keep it going. It's up to us to keep it going. My purpose of, of walking the jazz is to protect her, make sure she's safe, make sure she's uh, comfortable. Moore is from the Crane River First Nation and attended day school. My mom was a residential school survivor and they hid my dad in the bushes when they were coming for him for residential school. And they, they took half of the rations away from my granny and grandpa because of that. Moore says last year's walk joined people together. It was an opportunity to educate while sharing stories from other survivors. We met a lot of people that talked to us and these were non-Aboriginal people from all walks of life. I would like to see people come out, tell more stories about what's happened, what happened to them. Like uh, we heard stories from people that have never been told before. These people never told anybody those stories until they saw us. So that means something. Next year, Lavalley plans to walk to Canada's northern coast in Tuktoyaktuk, and the year after to New Orleans to touch the Gulf of Mexico. But for this walk, the hope is to make it to Nova Scotia in 90 days to share the stories of survivors and those who never made it home. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The Mary River Mine operates on the northern side of Baffin Island in the Canadian Arctic. It's one of the world's richest reserves of high-grade iron ore, but not everyone is on board with it. Heather Exner Perot is a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute. She joins us now to talk about what's happening with the mine. Heather, hello. Thank you so much for joining joining us here today. Thanks for having me. Now, you recently wrote an opinion piece about the issues around the Mary River mine. Um, I guess we'll just start with how important is this mine? Well, for the territory of Nunavut and for the Inuit in the region, it's very important. It's, you know, value is about a quarter of Nunavut's GDP right now. Uh, so, it, you know, it provides hundreds of jobs for Inuit. And in remote areas, there aren't always a lot of other opportunities. You know, they, they are few and far in between. It's very expensive to start a mine in Northern Canada. Uh, so it's unlikely to be, you know, replaced with anything anytime soon. Now, you also mentioned in your piece that in 2021, a group of seven Inuit trappers blockaded the mine's airstrip. Uh, what did they, or sorry, why did they do that? And uh, what's been the result from that? So this is a, a very complex issue. It's not, you know, it's not black and white. They were blocking it because they felt that the impacts of the mine were affecting their ability to hunt and feed their families and feed their communities. So they are very serious concerns. Uh, the mine for its part has tried to mitigate as much as possible, as much as was required, all those impacts and trying to do other things also. The mine says it needs another expansion in order to become economic. It hasn't uh, posted any profits yet. And, and, and because of the blockade, it looks unlikely to pass. And as you just mentioned, uh, the expansion, so now the federal government is expected to approve or deny the phase two expansion. So what would a yes or a no mean for both the mine and for the Inuit? Yeah, great question. So uh, a yes means it'll be able to double its production, um, you know, from 6 million tons of ore to 12 million. And that means that the mine will have a long, healthy life, probably 20, 25 years, and be providing billions of dollars in royalties to the regional Inuit organization, the territory, the federal government, uh, and of course, jobs to all the families uh, in the region. 
Uh, a no uh, would, you know, from an environmental perspective, there's some that would consider that to be a win, that there won't be more traffic, there won't be a railroad uh, built that could impact caribou, uh, marine traffic that would impact narwhal, uh, and that, you know, closer to kind of the, tr you know, traditional hunting uh, conditions would be able to be achieved for the hunters. So Heather, are there any other solutions uh, in this matter? You know, I think that, for the for the investors in the mine, I think you know they want to see this project obviously go ahead. Um, I think they've done what whatever they think could economically be done uh, to keep the mine going and to meet the concerns. But I think unfortunately the issue has become political. Uh, for me, that's the main problem that it's kind of been removed from a negotiating space to one where it's political. Um, and the the, narr the options have become very narrow. Uh, so it's a sad state of affairs. Hopefully, you know, hopefully you can move forward. If iron ore prices keep going up, the company might just continue uh, at the lower rate, but it's complicated for sure. And certainly illustrates the challenges we have in Northern Canada and Inuit have in creating economic development. All right, Heather, certainly plenty to think about. We'll have to leave it uh, right there, but we certainly appreciate you taking a few minutes out of your day to speak with us about this. Thanks very much. All right, we need to step aside for a short break. Still ahead, a Northern Ontario First Nation is experiencing a severe nursing shortage. Welcome back. 
A Northern Ontario First Nation is experiencing a severe nursing shortage which is causing a major disruption of healthcare services. The Kosheshawan First Nation nursing station is down to three primary care nurses and is able to offer emergency services only. Dennis Ward spoke to Kosheshawan Health Director Jonathan Solomon earlier. Jonathan, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, can you tell our viewers a bit about how the nursing shortage arose and how it's affecting the community? Well, it started uh, about a month and a half ago when we began to see the declination of uh, nurses that uh, come into the community. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it really impacted everything, the service delivery um, at the nursing station. Uh, because they began to operate on emergencies mode only. That meaning that only uh, people with um, a serious situation were the ones that uh, got to be seen by the nurses. And all the other uh, general um, care was uh, put aside, like appointments or walk-ins mm -hmm. and um, even blood work. So it really impacted the whole operations of the nursing station. Kaseshawan's pretty far north. Where are residents uh, being forced to go uh, with, to try and access some of these services? Right now, the general, uh, the general uh, client, um, they're just here at home. They don't, um, they're, they're not being sent out. Only emergency, uh, cases are being sent out either medevac or put on the um, patient charter plane uh, for those that have appointments um, in Timmins or most factory or Kingston. Now we understand you've been in regular communication uh, with Indigenous Services Canada about the situation. Can you give us an update on, on where those talks are at? Um, it's progressing. We've made a lot of headways uh, since last, this weekend. Um, we now uh, we're working with our regional health authority now, um, working with a nursing agency. Other than what uh, what is um, have an agreement with a national organization. Now um, they're going to start. We're going to start seeing uh, nurses in our community. Um, in the days or weeks to come. And that will complement um, the um, existing rotation that um, the government or ISC provides on, on two week basis. So it will complement um, their nurses uh, in regards to that agreement. Mm -hmm. And um, WAHA or Winnebago Health Authority um, are taking a, a role on that because they have to sign a contribution agreement for that service mm. uh, and they have a, a contract with this particular um, nursing agency that uh, that we approached and um, we expect one nurse uh, by tomorrow and then um, the nurses will start rolling in we're, we're going to have a nurse practitioner too under that uh, agreement that contract so um, so I'd say in about a month, um, uh, things will sta stabilize uh, if things go well. And um, uh, it's not fast enough. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, <clears throat> my nurses here, our nurses here in, at the nursing station at this moment, I went to see, I was talking to them yesterday and they're getting very tired. I bet. Uh, they've been here for one week and they've been very busy, though they're only, um, operating under emergency mode only because uh, the number of clients that, uh, that need emergency care uh, flow in, uh, come in every day. And even medevacs, there's even one or two medevacs a day. So the situation is very uh, serious. And um, like I said, our, our nurses are getting very tired, uh, sleeps as nights, you know, uh, though they try to rotate. And with that number of nurses on the floor, it's just, um, I can understand why they're so tired because of the number of cases that they're dealing with on a daily basis. Earlier in the week, Indigenous Services Canada had uh, told us that some of the nurses in your community have uh, experienced violence on the job. Can you tell us a bit more about that? 
Um, there are uh, maybe situations where somebody uh, uh, may be violent uh, because they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And um, in a situation like this, um, there, I was I was advised that there was a situation um, one evening, one night, and um, but um, that's 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 and that's the challenge of having uh, just for uh, a number of uh, only a limited number of nurses in, in the nursing station, mm -hmm. and um, you know so um, some people are. Uh, you know, like I said, they, they may be under the influence of alcohol or other uh, prohibited uh, substances. So that's that's what happened. And um, uh, we have security here. Um, they took control of the situation. And um, and that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, we've always been concerned about is the, uh, is the well-being of our nurses. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, they've sent they sent in some security uh, support for a few days, maybe to run for two weeks to support our um, our security at the moment. Um, we had a festival here last week, um, and it was a very a uh, community festival, and um, a lot of our staff took part in that uh, on that festival and. Um, uh, I know in a few cases uh, security weren't there uh, because they wanted to take part in the community festival. So it's, it's not something that's normal uh, everyday thing. Like uh, we have a steady uh, security personnel that I um, that I am very proud of mm -hmm. uh, in what they do and the service that they provide. Jonathan, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, we hope the situation improves in the community soon. Appreciate you taking some time for us. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. Two Mi'kmaq chefs from Listigouche, Quebec, were two friends running a takeout business out of a house. Now they have their own restaurant across the bridge in Campbellton, New Brunswick. Eli Isaac and Chad Isaac have been friends since they were kids. But this spring, they took that friendship to the next level. When the city of Campbellton approached them to open their own restaurant in a vacant waterfront building, Crave Kitchen opened in May, and business for Eli and Chad has been booming since. I was living in Halifax, my wife got pregnant, so we decided to move home because all the family's here. And when I moved home, I didn't want to really look for a job because there's not much in this field around here, so I started doing takeout from home. And that kind of led into this business. I never thought when we were first opening a restaurant we would have such a beautiful location, right? Like normally you gotta kind of build up and this would be like the end of where you're going, whereas we're starting here. It's pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Time for one final break. Still to come, our photo of the day.
Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. David Laron sent in this great shot from what appears to be his deck overlooking Lake Temagami, located in northeastern Ontario. Thanks for sending this in, David. That's a great shot right there. If you have a great photo, you can send it by email to share at aptn.ca and it might be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 25 and sun in Halifax and 20 in St. John's. 20 and clear in Cartwright and 21 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. 26 degrees in Quebec City and 30 and clear in Montreal. Some showers in 22 in North Bay and 30 in London. 14 and some showers in Timmins and 16 in showers in Big Trout Lake. 11 degrees in Churchill and clear in 23 in Norway House. 22 and sun in Barrens River and 22 in Winnipeg. 25 degrees in Estevan and 26 in North Battleford. 27 in Meadow Lake and 17 in Stony Rapids. Moving west to 23 in Fort Chippewan and 31 in Peace River. 32 in Sun in Edmonton and Sun in 30 in Calgary. 23 degrees in Vancouver and 21 in Bella Coola. 17 and some showers in Prince Rupert and 23 in Fort Nelson. 17 in Whitehorse and 17 in Old Crow. 23 in Norman Wells and 21 in Clear in Yellowknife. 15 in Inuvik and 20 in Colville Lake. 12 degrees in Cambridge Bay and 13 in Whale Cove. 2 degrees in Resolute and 9 degrees in Clyde River. In British Columbia, a new totem pole has been raised outside of a student housing building at Coast Mountain College's Terrace Campus. The totem's design is dedicated to the Simshian territory of Kitsumkalem Laxbu clan. The pole features a wolf and bear, as well as a matriarch figure between the wolf's ears and a male figure holding a copper shield. Master carver Stan Bevan led the design of the pole with alumni from the Frida Deezing School of Northwest Art. The totem is a result of the college's First Nations Council request that student housing reflect the culture of the region. When people see the pole, um, they will they will ask questions in terms of um, what does the pole mean, what's the story on the pole, and we'll learn that the uh, pole is um, tells the story of the wolf, the what would be called the lucky boo of. Um, of the Karens area. All right, that's all we have for you on this Friday edition of APTN National News. For news anytime, as always, visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. For all of us here, thank you for joining us. Miigwech and have a great long weekend.